movement for change. We know how to improve the working conditions of women community health workers. We have good practices to draw on from government speaking today that have professionalized community health workers. I look forward to hearing from our speakers to the day, um, to this day when community health workers are seen not only as volunteers, but as drivers of change and experts in the health of their communities. So on that note, um, I'm very excited um, to hear from our speakers and I'd like to first invite uh, His Excellency Dr. Deniso Kumba, Minister of Public Health from Guinea-Bissau to give a short message on the Gender Equal Initiative. Experts in the health of their communities. So on that note, um, I'm very excited um, to hear from our speakers and I'd like to first invite uh, His Excellency Dr. Deniso Kumba, Minister of Public Health from Guinea-Bissau to give a short message on the Gender Equal Initiative. Experts in the health of their communities. Hi, technically, uh, just to the technical team, I'm not hearing any audio. I'm wondering if others are. Sorry, one second. I'm going to stop the share, restart it, and we should hear it the next time. Sorry about this. Thank you for the patience as we resolve these technical challenges. I'm still on. I can share my screen and, and share the video. I, I, I see that the sound is on mute on the left corner of that video in case, um, Joan, you're able to unmute it. Yep, sorry. It's, um, no, I'll, I'll hand over to Anna. Okay, all right. Again, thank you everyone for your patience as we um, uh, try an option number two. Even with uh, two plus years into our virtual world, we still face challenges. So again, thank you for being patient. Excelências, ilustres convidados, é com grande prazer que, em nome do governo da Guiné-Bissau, confirmo o nosso apoio à Iniciativa para a Igualdade de Gênero entre profissionais e prestadores de cuidado de saúde, liderada pela França e pelas mulheres na saúde global. A pandemia levou os sistemas de saúde e os profissionais de saúde ao limite e demonstrou, uma vez mais, que a nossa saúde depende do trabalho das mulheres. Para milhões de pessoas, as mulheres trabalhadoras comunitárias de saúde são o seu primeiro ponto de contato com o sistema de saúde. Temos de garantir que estão equipadas para fazer o seu trabalho e que são valorizadas pelo seu trabalho. Por conseguinte, estamos plenamente empenhados na ação sobre os quatro pilares estratégicos da iniciativa, isto é, aumentar a proporção de mulheres na liderança em matéria de saúde, abordar a igualdade de remuneração e o trabalho não remunerado das mulheres no domínio da saúde, proteger as trabalhadoras de saúde sobre o assédio e a violência e assegurar condições de trabalho seguras e decentes 
para todos os trabalhadores da saúde em todo o lado. Se conseguirmos capacitar as mulheres profissionais de saúde através de melhores condições de trabalho, beneficiaremos a saúde de todos na sociedade. Daqui a um ano, os chefes de Estado e do Governo reunir-se-ão nas Nações Unidas, na segunda reunião do alto nível, sobre a cobertura universal da saúde e será uma oportunidade para avaliar os progressos e os desafios que devemos enfrentar juntos. A pandemia fez recuar o mundo em termos da segurança sanitária. Os trabalhadores da saúde deram o seu melhor na luta contra a Covid-19, muitos morreram e muitos outros sofrem de doenças ao longo prazo devido ao vírus. Ao mesmo tempo, os trabalhadores da saúde em países de alto rendimento estão a admitir-se da profissão de saúde em número significativo porque estão exaustos e desencorajados. Preocupa-nos que haja pressão para que os nossos trabalhadores de saúde formados e capacitados migrem para países que lhes possam pagar mais, tornando ainda mais difícil para nós construir sistemas de saúde fortes e sustentáveis e alcançar a cobertura universal da saúde. Por conseguinte, estamos satisfeitos por termos hoje esta oportunidade de fazer parte deste evento, de fazer parte de um movimento mais vasto que trabalha em prol da igualdade de gênero na força de trabalho de saúde. O meu país, a Guiné-Bissau, está orgulhoso de se juntar aos outros países que já aderiram a, a esta iniciativa, nomeadamente o Brasil e Cabo Verde, países lusófonos como a Guiné-Bissau. Comprometemos-nos a tudo fazer para melhorar as condições do trabalho, estancar o assédio e a violência e promover as mulheres a posições de liderança na saúde. Agradeço o convite para participar neste evento e desejo os maiores sucessos a esta nobre iniciativa. bem a todos e muito obrigado pelo vosso trabalho e pela vossa maravilhosa iniciativa. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Dr. Combo, um, we really appreciate the commitment um, that you have presented on behalf of Guinea-Bissau and welcome to the initiative. Um, we now uh, would like to welcome His Excellency Dr. Um, uh, Orlando, uh, Arlindo uh, Rosario, Minister of Health from Cabo Verde, uh, who's also gonna be giving an expression of support um, on behalf of his country for the Gender Equal Healthcare Workforce Initiative. Um, turning back again uh, to our technical team to put that video on. It is also in Portuguese and encouraging you to use the interpretation, which lets you switch between Portuguese and English on the um, bottom right corner globe. La Constitution de la République garantit les droits à la santé pour tous les citoyens et incombe à l'État de veiller à ce que ces principes soient mis en pratique. En termes de soins de santé primaire, la population capverdienne est globalement bien desservie par un vaste réseau d'infrastructures et de services de santé, d'unités sanitaires, de base, jusqu'à Poste de santé, centre de santé et hôpitaux régional à Saint-Paul. Actuellement, l'ensemble de la population se trouve à moins de demi-heure 
l'infrastructure. Le, le, Depuis l'indépendance du pays, les femmes ont activement contribué à la mise en place du système national de santé et à ce moment la promotion de la santé et la prévention des maladies à tous les niveaux de soins, principalement dans les soins primaires et secondaires. Selon les dernières données, elle, elle représente environ 65% du personnel de santé. Malgré les progrès enregistrés dans le système national de santé, certains défis persistent à se voir. Mesurer l'impact socio-économique de la mandure féminine dans les santé communautaires, adopter une budgétisation sensible aux gens dans la gestion de la santé, supprimer des obstacles socioculturels et d'accès aux soins de santé, y compris les soins de santé sexuelle, sexuelle et reproductive, accroître le leadership des femmes à la rendre visible dans les politiques de santé. Nous vous félicitons, félicitons donc pour cette initiative mondiale sur l'approche du genre dans la santé et retenons notre ferme engagement à vous rejoindre à ces mouvements transformateurs en faveur de la justice et de plus grande équité et égalité pour tout temps de accès aux soins de santé. Bon travail à tous. And thank you, Dr. Um, Arlando Rosario, um, for your expression of uh, support. Um, and now we turn uh, to Dr. Fernanda Copertino from the government of Brazil um, to express support for the initiative as well. Welcome, please. Muito obrigado. Uh, good morning. Bonjour. Buenos dias. E bom dia a todos, senhoras e senhores. Em nome do Conselho Nacional de Secretários de Saúde do Brasil, o CONAS, organização que congrega os 27 gestores estaduais de saúde do Brasil, saúdo a feliz iniciativa denominada Mulheres na Saúde Global, com a qual nossa instituição se comprometeu em apoiar. No mês passado, nosso presidente, Dr. Nézio Fernandes de Medeiros Júnior, assinou a carta de compromisso, na qual assumimos a tarefa de continuar o trabalho em prol da redução das desigualdades de gênero e para reconhecer cada vez mais o papel destacado e a importante contribuição da mulher na área da saúde. Mais que simples compromissos enunciados em palavras, é preciso que todos nos esforcemos para que a mulher tenha o espaço que lhe é devido nos cargos de liderança de nossos sistemas e serviços de saúde, para que delas não seja retirado o legítimo direito da paridade salarial para que não sofram assédio e violência em seus locais de trabalho, e se por infelicidade com eles se defrontarem, que os mecanismos legais sejam prontamente acionados. E ainda que a elas, como de resto a todos os trabalhadores da saúde, sejam garantidas as condições seguras e decentes para o exercício de suas atividades profissionais. Vale ressaltar que o Sistema Único de Saúde brasileiro, público, universal, e cogerido pelos níveis nacional, estadual e municipal, possuía, em dados oficiais de 2019, quase 3 milhões de trabalhadores, que incluem as mais diferentes profissões de nível superior, assim como técnicos em saúde, agentes comunitários e técnicos administrativos. Com a pandemia, esse contingente superou os 3 milhões de pessoas quando falamos apenas do sistema público de saúde. Quando analisamos o contexto nacional, englobando os setores público e privado, as mulheres são a principal força de trabalho da saúde. Representam 65% dos mais de 6 milhões de profissionais ocupados nos dois setores, tanto nas atividades diretas de assistência em hospitais, quanto nos cuidados de saúde primários. Segundo dados do Instituto Brasileiro de Geografia e Estatística, em certas carreiras, como a fonoaudiologia, a nutrição e o serviço social, elas alcançam quase a totalidade, ultrapassando 90% de participação. Em outras áreas, como enfermagem e psicologia, estão com percentuais acima de 80%. Assim, não se trata de favorecimento ou privilégio. 
trata-se de agir com respeito, dignidade e reconhecimento à figura da mulher, que, investida de atribuições e responsabilidades na área da saúde em seus mais diversos campos, a ela agrega o valor não apenas do seu contributo técnico-científico, mas de sua sensibilidade, humanidade, senso prático e de organização. Isto posto, o CONAS perfila-se ao lado das instituições que abraçam essa causa e por ela desenvolverá o melhor de seus esforços. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Dr. Copertino. We really welcome uh, the government of Brazil and CONAS into this initiative. Um, I would like to next invite and turn to uh, Dr. Shuba Rashid Jal, who will be speaking on behalf of UNICEF. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues um, and uh, participants to this uh, important webinar. On behalf of sector, uh, health sector and team in UNICEF, I'm uh, representing UNICEF today, and uh, UNICEF welcomes and and acknowledge and support the um, the initiative led by Global Women Health and uh, Government of France of equal gender equal health and care workforce initiative, and we commit to work with you to endorse the objectives of this uh, initiative in terms of uh, increasing the proportion of women health workforce in leadership roles, uh, uh, recognizing the value of unpaid health and care work, uh, protecting women in their uh, workplace, and ensuring safe and decent work conditions for all health workers. UNICEF works with other partners and commits to encourage other partners to also uh, in, uh, support this initiative. Also uh, uh, to, to, to work with the partners jointly to address some of the challenges of this particular important issue that we are talking about. Uh, a recent study in uh, UNICEF regional office in uh, um, uh, South Africa, uh, South Asia, have identified several barriers for engage for the women, female workforce cadre, including social barriers, individual barriers, community barriers, mobility restriction, perceptions around them, system barriers, recruitment, uh, uh, work pace, uh, workspace, uh, discrimination, stigma around their work, uh, ability to move around, but the study also have identified solutions that we can all work together to address those barriers and make the environment more conducive for female health workers, enable them, empower them, give them the leadership position and uh, provide them the, uh, the opportunity to progress in their careers as valid a uh, community health worker who can contribute to their uh, countries and communities uh, through the health system and ensure that this is not only an empowerment for the health sector itself, but it's a gender equality empowerment that spills over other sectors in life and it spills over the community and, com uh, and the national uh, strategies. So UNICEF again welcomes this initiative and is, is committing to be part and uh, support and encourage all participants and actors to enroll in this and support the, this important uh, cadre through different programmatic interventions, uh, collaboration through the uh, primary health care centers, uh, collaboration through system reforms, collaboration through uh, budgetary financing of the health. All these elements need to be considering the female health workforce, and we welcome this idea, and we are to get working together with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. We are honored to have UNICEF join the initiative and we look forward to learning uh, more about UNICEF's work and uh, collaborating. On that note, as the momentum continues, it's so exciting to have so many um, new partners join us. Um, I'd like to invite next uh, one more expression of support from the CEO of Integrate Health, Ms. Jennifer uh, Scheiter. Thank you, Rupa. Hi, everyone. I am Jenny Schechter, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Integrate Health. 
As a woman-led healthcare organization, we believe that healthcare must be designed by and for women as patients, as providers, and as leaders. The Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative will help us do just that. In 2015, our organization launched the Integrated Primary Care Program in partnership with the Togolese Ministry of Health to pilot a cadre of professional community health workers. Gender equity was a key priority in the recruitment of community health workers who would be equipped, trained, supervised, and salaried. But our team was met with a lot of resistance. Many people told us that we simply would not be able to find women capable of working as community health workers. So we took on this challenge, and I am very proud to say that today, over 95% of the 200 community health workers supported by Integrate Health are women. Community health workers are not only changing the way healthcare is delivered in their communities, they are changing the way their communities see women. Now, I will never forget this day. I was in a village in Northern Togo shadowing an amazing young community health worker named Afi when the village chief came running out of his house across the compound down the street to stop me in my tracks to tell me how proud he was of his community health worker. Now, he went on and on describing Afi's work, all of the effort that she put in every day, and the impact that it was having on his community members. I did not think I would see the day when an 80-something-year-old Togolese man chased me down to laud his praises on a 20-something-year-old Togolese woman, but it happened. And in fact, local chiefs have become some of our biggest advocates demanding the expansion of professional female community health workers in Togo. Today's initiative represents for our organization the continuation of a long-held commitment to employing women as community health workers and across every level in our organization, including as senior leaders. And I am very proud that we share this commitment to gender equity with our partners in the Togolese government and the Ministry of Health. Togo's Prime Minister and Minister for Universal Health Coverage are both women leading their country's response at the intersection of health and gender equity and serving as incredible role models themselves. So it is following their lead and following the example of community health workers like Afi, that I am incredibly proud today to pledge our commitment on behalf of everyone at Integrate Health to this initiative and to continuing to ensure that more women move into senior leadership positions, both in our organization and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer Shasher. Uh, we really appreciate your expression of support. Um, and look forward to also the collaborations um, with the government of Togo, um, as, as you have mentioned, um, the critical work that's taking place there. So on, on that note, um, I'm uh, very excited to hand it over to our partner for this event um, to moderate the next part of uh, our session, um, Ms. Malika Raghavan, uh, Managing Director and of Program Strategy and Performance at Last Mile Health. It's been um, great to connect with all of you, but the program continues and welcome to all our new partners as we uh, look forward to working with all of you. Malika, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rupa, and um, hello again, and uh, welcome everyone to um, the uh, event today. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this section of our event, where we're going to hear directly from leaders from ministries of health who have shown tremendous leadership in designing and implementing gender transformative policies for community health programs. Um, we'll learn about programs like those in Ethiopia and Pakistan today and what has been successful, but also quite challenging in building strong female workforces. I hope that this portion of today's program serves as an opportunity to learn how we can better support governments in these goals around gender equity, but it also serves as an example of inspiration of both what's achievable and possible 
um, when, when we work together. To kick us off, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mezaret Zelem, who I recently actually had the pleasure of spending time with in Ethiopia. Dr. Mezaret serves as the Director for Reproductive Maternal Newborn Child Adolescent Youth Health and Nutrition at the Ethiopia Federal Ministry of Health. She started her professional career as a lecturer and was later promoted to the academic rank of Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Child Health at um, the uh, University of Gondar College of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Mezarat is a senior medical specialist in pediatrics and child health. She's engaged in research, academia, clinical service, community service, and health leadership. Um, as her in her role at the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, she also wears a number of other hats. This includes being the secretary for the National Food and Nutrition Coordination Body and for the National COVID-19 vaccination rollout. She's a technical advisory team member for the African Region World Health Organization, a technical member to Gavi, and a board member for Debre Tabor University. Dr. Mezaret, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the generous introduction, uh, my sister Malika. It's really my honor to be in this panel. Uh, uh, thank you so much once again, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, wherever you are in a different time zone, uh, good afternoon, um, good evening to you all. I really appreciate the organizers for bringing this uh, very timely agenda, gender equity in healthcare workers, women in a global health last mile community health coalition and the government organization for organizing this very amazing panel. And I also appreciate the commit commitment of the UN organizations and other stakeholders for supporting the different member states. You know, um, the healthcare workers in Ethiopia are really incredible people doing incredible activities, whatever the situation we face, you know, the COVID impact and also there were also a conflict in the Northern part of Ethiopia. And also there was uh, like, um, an environmental change, uh, you know, the drought effect, were also affecting uh, lowland part of Ethiopia. So our health workers are really incredible. Working the internet are really pretty resilient. I really appreciate for that. And also, you know, uh, it's not the success is not without consequence. Uh, while reporting is limited, we estimate that at least one from ten health workers have their uh, lives. I mean, uh, lost their through COVID nineteen. Um, you know, they have lost their life, has been infected across the world due to COVID-19 pandemic. And it's really fitting that like the 2022 is the international year of the health and care worker because we all uh, done so much. And uh, this is really appreciated and very much commendable. And there is much more we can do also uh, as leaders to recognize them for this serving service. I would like to really, um, I do mean to more for my country. Uh, you know, Ethiopia is one of the second populous country in Africa. I can say the highest time in the first uh, populous in Eastern part of Africa and second in the whole of uh, the continent next to, you know, uh, Nigeria. So we really crossed uh, 102 million in terms of the population size. So 50% of the population is women. And also the larger portion is youth and adolescent in pediatric age groups as well. So when we see the majority of the Ethiopian uh, health workforce, almost 52% are women. Uh, if we break it down to the different discipline and uh, from this 52%, like 48% goes to the nurses and 64% uh, midwives and 20% of them are physicians in all level. So in addition to this, uh, particularly, we have a brand health extension program. Uh, you know, Ethiopia is uh, you know, well known about this health extension program. And uh, we reached out our community through the health extension program using the health extension workers. So they're in total 40,000 for all. And also of them, 98% of them are women and most of them are young age groups. So this really, the figure really speaks by its, you know, by themselves. So the world is really reliant on women to deliver health and care services as well. And also when we see the service, it's more for women, newborns, children, adolescents, and health, I mean, users and also reproductive age. So that the service is also tailored for women, uh, child and newborn and adolescent. So that most of the health workforce are really the women. 
So that this is really fundamental to discuss about the women in equal position with equal salary with the due attention as well, which my country is, is really doing best for that. So this really has demand that we ask ourselves a very tough question on a work condition and equity, you know, including how we can value and reward women in the health and care workforce and how we guarantee the, that workforce are workplaces are really conducive free of discrimination, violence, sexual exploitation and abuse as well. So the Gender Equal Heads and Care Workforce Initiative and partnership between the WHO government of Ethiopia, women in global health is an important step towards addressing these issues as well. So we look forward to work very hard with this uh, organizations and other beyond as well. So in Ethiopia, the health and care sector employs a great percentage of women than any other, which uh, means action to better support women in this field can make an immediate difference for women in the workforce as a whole. So there is the focus areas to minimize the gender difference. We are working together so that women, women are protected from harassment, discrimination, and violence at the workplace. Areas that require special focus in this regard are under-resourced setting or harsh conditions, such as you know, we have refuge camps and shelter. You know, you can see Ethiopia as one of the big countries hosting a large number of refugees from the continent as well. So there is changing change must be driven from the very top, which means ensuring women's representation leadership position. I can't really mention my country is a pretty example uh, in the continent. You know, we have Madam uh, President, you know, you know, we have uh, excellency, the president is a woman, 50% of the cabinet members are women. And also I'm really happy and honored to express 50% of the member of parliaments are women. I'm also a part of that. I'm really pretty stunned to express this one. So uh, my government is pretty committed to bring women in the highest the top level leadership. So this is really commendable. I would like to appreciate my government is doing this very best. Do this best to the lower levels, from the national, subnational to the community to the lower level. So we have, you know, this is a top agenda in the um, government of Ethiopia. So finally, I, I can say at minimum, women leadership numbers should be equal with men which is 50-50, but in truth, it should be proportional with their share of all jobs. Like I can say 70-30% when you see the global distribution, the Gender Equality Forum presents at the opportunity not just to acknowledge this challenge and ambition, but to take an action. So this is a great call to action for all of us to table this agenda, to work for its well implementation for action. So Ethiopia Minister of Health is committed to advocate for decent and safe work condition for all hands, and care work, workers, especially for women, in a different situation, serving the community, serving the citizens, serving everyone as a human as well. So I ask you all to join with Ethiopia and our civil society partners to work together to better protect and invest in those who are protecting us, who are really selflessly working for us, who are dedicated for the heads of the citizen. So equality, equality is something we have to work for, so this is a great call to action. Uh, we I really appreciate for the panel. Together, we can make a difference in the 21st century in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic and a different situation happening here in there. I thank you very much once again. Thank you, the moderator. Over to you. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mezerat. And Again, for your leadership, for all you do to champion health extension workers in Ethiopia, and of course, as you serve as a role model and a leader. Um, I would now love to um, introduce you to our next panelist, um, Dr. Shobham Sarfraz. Um, Dr. Sarfraz is a health and development professional with over 15 years of senior leadership level experience. She is a medical doctor with an MBA from the University of Surrey and a postgraduate certification from McGill, Johns Hopkins, and Harvard University. She is currently serving as a member of the social sector and and devolution for the government of Pakistan's planning commission and managing the complete portfolio of the social sector, which includes health, education, gender, population, sustainable development goals, manpower, and social welfare. That is a lot. She's also leading the COVID-19 secretariat. 
Dr. Sarfraz has been a visiting scientist at Harvard Global Health Institute. She is a Charles Wallace scholar and an inaugural fellow of the Harvard LEAD program. She's also the co-founder and country lead for Women in Global Health's Pakistan chapter, which is working to address gender parity in the health workforce. Dr. Sarfraz, welcome, and we'll turn it over to you for some remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just put together a few slides, which I'll just be running. Uh, thank you so much. I thank you all for inviting me to share Pakistan's story of experiences with community health workers programs, story of the structures that we have tried to put in place, their impact and footprint, the lessons learned, improvements that have been made so far, and also the challenges which continue to, uh, we continue to battle. I would like to break down the story into four parts, the context and the beginning about the lady health workers, what we have learned, where we have improved, and where we continue to struggle today. Women constitute over 49% of the total population of our country. We are yet to recognize the potential they offer if we manage to close the gender gap. Uh, I think my slides are not moving. Uh, are they moving? Uh, See, okay. So we uh, have about 49% of our population is women. And uh, as I was saying that we are yet to re realize the potential that this brings to the country by closing the gap that the gender gap, which is extremely wide at the education level, uh, and even more so at the labor force participation level. And uh, this, uh, this is something that, uh, that also uh, infiltrates into the health sector as well. We are a country which has about, uh, we, we have about four provinces and we have three regions. Di these are, there is a diverse culture, diverse geographic landscape. And, uh, and also there, is a, there are multitudes of ways in which women of these different culture, cultures continue to contribute both at the household level as well as at the, at, at, at the economic level. And uh, Pakistan is not one average number and huge disparities across provinces and within provinces uh, in the districts, which, which is a smaller geographic uh, component, they continue to exist in there. We are uh, the fifth most populous country in the world. Uh, but we understandably we do have uh, a, a, a devolved mandate around health and the service delivery and at the federal planning commission where I serve is the apex planning and coordination body which has the convening power to bring all the provinces together and also stimulate health human resource planning and also um, uh, manpower planning and also regulations which uh, which are critical for us to undertake in view of the challenges that we continue uh, to confront. Population continues to be the denominator of so many problems that the country is facing. Uh, the large population size, the unplanned population growth, and this was actually something which was behind the Lady Health Worker Program when it was launched. We are, as I said earlier, the fifth most populous country, and 60% of our population is younger than 30 years. And this is the group which has uh, the highest unmet need for family planning and where the role of the lady health worker, workers at, uh, at the time that we had conceived the program was thought to be critical. A third of the Pakistani population is living in poverty and we are predicted to contribute to one fifth of the global population by 2030. Whereas the doubling time for population in other South Asian countries is 60 years, Pakistan continues to double its population every 30 year. The SDGs, we continue to track the, all the 17 SDGs. And uh, as I said earlier, the large population size and the limited resources, which become even more limited as the population sizes uh, continues to increase. We add, uh, add up a New Zealand every year to our population, five, uh, our population growth rate is around 5 million. And so the, G the GDP that we have and the per capita is divided uh, in the, to, um, amongst the population size of about 230 million at the moment, uh, as compared to New Zealand. 
And uh, that is something that we are uh, continuing to, I think this is something that has been uh, the biggest challenge for the country and uh, will continue to, uh, to be unless uh, we take a, 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 some, a, some dramatic measures. Whereas we do monitor the, uh, su the sustainable development goals, uh, we, also we also continue uh, use the data to track individual indicators in there. And as we do so, we also try to see that which are the lagging districts. Uh, uh, what you see over here is a disaggregation where we try to, to see where actually the investment needs, needs to go in if we are to improve on these uh, indicators. We also uh, uh, have platforms available and some training programs with our neighboring countries where we try to learn how they have improved uh, on some of these indicators. And at the same time, we've created some very uh, uh, productive uh, forums which where we are sharing stories of how we have uh, battled with some of the indicators and have improved on to them. So what you see over here is that we have uh, is uh, we have the second highest improvement in, uh, re uh, reported in the region in terms of skill birth attendance and all and this is this is hugely contributed by the community health workers, our uh, cater of the community health, wi uh, health wives, and also the lady health worker program. Again, there has been a lot of improvement which has come uh, in terms of vaccination, as uh, is depicted in here. And uh, over here as well, our community health workers, our vaccinators, as well as our our lady, uh, our community midwifery program plays an important role. Now, delving a little deeper onto uh, the community health work workforce program within the provinces. Within the provinces, we uh, I think uh, somehow my uh, slides get stuck uh, with the video being on, and that's why I'm uh, I just wanted them to flow uh, smoothly. So if it's okay, I'll just switch off the video for for the moment. So within the provinces, we have a tiered uh, structure uh, comprising of tertiary care teaching hospitals. We have the district headquarter hospitals, and then we have uh, rural health centers. Uh, which serve a catchment population of up to 100,000 people. And finally, we have the basic health units, which are at the union council level, and they cater to a population of 25,000 people and are supported by a foot force, the community health workers. Okay, so here you see, uh, and uh, it is estimated at the moment that we have about 89,000 community health workers which comprise largely of the lady health worker program. In a country uh, where we are, uh, we recognize that we have a critical shortage of health human resource. These community health workers continue to be the major health workforce, which is available to a large segment of uh, the population. Uh, these community health workers, uh, they include different cadres. Uh, I've mentioned them before, the community midwives, the lady health visitors. We also have family welfare workers, outreach workers, the community mobilizers. Now, uh, now if you would, uh, would want, I would want to uh, just share a little bit uh, background to the importance and uh, the, uh, how it was conceptualized as a low middle income country currently bearing the brunt of global climate crisis, Pakistan has its share of health challenges. However, these challenges have also been windows of opportunities to trial and pilot interventions like we did in 1994, when the 1978 Alma Atta rightfully established the community health workforce as the backbone of a strong and robust national public health system and synonymous with the primary healthcare approach. However, as also documented in Almayata, this community health worker system must be contextually designed, evolving from the country's communities, its social, cultural, and political characteristics. Like other countries, we have, an, um, uh, we have uh, Pakistan has this, uh, uh, a number of cadres who constitute the community health worker uh, program. So what you see over here is that we were one of the earliest in the 1950s as realizers 
of the family planning program uh, family planning and the family planning association of program pakistan was one of the pioneers in the region to have that but we were unable to keep that pace and uh, whereas many other countries were able to um, tackle the population uh, issue in, in a much more robust way and uh, uh, this this is where that we are uh, trying to uh, now uh, revive the program and align it to the initial uh, concept which was behind the lady health worker program today are as i said that the are uh, now the scope of work which these lady health workers are doing the program has been evaluated as historically the most co cohesive and standardized program in the country initially it was being operated by the ministry of health but now it has become it has devolved and has gone down to uh, the provinces following uh, the 18th amendment uh, the du duty wise if we look at it the um, uh, they are the they are uh, the lady health workers they work in the communities following up on antenatal and postnatal care at homes referring patients to community midwives or the basic health unit which i mentioned was the first health facility uh, in the tiered system providing basic education and enhancing community awareness through household visits and con uh, consultation they also act as a link between the formal health system and the community they uh, played a very critical role uh, towards covid-19 immunization as well as health awareness and uh, uh, and they were uh, they continued to be uh, utilized as the main health workforce uh, in, in reaching out to marginalized population some of the gender related uh, policy works which uh, which we had done to um, uh, in the country uh, i uh, may we, it was mentioned we were the first uh, women in global health chapter in asia and uh, in 20 uh, using this policy space that we were occupying we were able to uh, get 1000 scholarships for professional development of nursing and strengthening of nursing and midwifery uh, prof uh, professionals and this uh, the year, in the year of nursing and midwifery in 2020 later in uh, this year uh, it, uh, we managed to uh, present the findings of a study and the 2022 was declared as the year of female employees uh, in the public sector and a number of initiatives became part of uh, our action matrix for which quarterly stock takes are happening uh, we had a pakistan pa power delegation which re uh, represented at the generation equality forum in 2021 Uh, there was a research study which the women in global health pakistan chapter uh, undertook with 85 women health leaders uh, of pakistan origin serving across the globe uh, there was another research study where covid-19 experiences of frontline health workers were uh, used and we find these the, these evidences uh, of great importance at uh, for advocating for certain policy reforms that we are continuing to pursue Uh, recently we did a gender uh, another study which was uh, done across all the ministries uh, at the federal government level to assess the gender conducive working environments and we uh, hope to replicate it in the coming uh, year across um, healthcare institutions to see uh, how, um, uh, how 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 they fare uh, for the different parameters which were evaluated thank you sir uh, Um if you could just uh, wrap up in the next 30 seconds that would be great this has been uh, wonderful but just this is my last this is my last slide so we uh, we uh, worked on the national gender policy framework which we were, which we were able to launch uh, this year and uh, we are in the uh, process of finalizing the strategic plan for the lady health workers and uh, also uh, we were uh, working very closely with WHO Uh, we uh, had the the government of pakistan had the commitments which were shared at the gender equality forum and we are uh, holding uh, several forums and also coordinating with partners uh, and uh, trying to see how we are progressing along these commitments so the the structures in the recent years these policy uh, uh, instruments have uh, have be, have come into effect and which are helping us in uh, synergizing our efforts across a diverse group of stakeholders thank you so much thank you thank you dr sarfraz um and i think 
should be very proud of the the community health program in Pakistan. I think both in Pakistan and Ethiopia, they they serve as models for I think what's possible. Um, so I wanted to again thank our panelists. Um, we're so grateful for the wisdom and leadership you've each brought to gender equity thus far in your respective countries. But we're also excited about the progress ahead and, and to cheer you on. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that unfortunately, um, Liberia Minister of Health Dr. Jala was un unable to join us today. However, we are very excited to share a paper that was just uh, published last week around gender in Liberia's community health workforce in the chat. So please take a read and um, we hope you'll also celebrate Liberia's accomplishments thus far. Um, next, I'd like to transition us um, to the next section of our event. We'll hear direct experiences from community health workers. First, we'll hear from Liberian community health worker Ruth David, and then from Dr. Rumi Aziz, who will speak on behalf of Pakistani community health workers um, who are unable to join us due to the, the current flooding in country. Community Health Assisting from Bogan Community to Street to Ben Assault County. I'm 25 years old. I work with the pregnant women and honor five. The pregnant women will frame the health facility and provide health care to them. The, the pregnant women in the community they were now having the idea to deliver to hospital. But since I've turned that the time of pregnancy for my daughter, I used to, I used to visit the clinic and give breath at the facility. But if you give breath, you give good care. Good care, you give to the pregnant woman if you give her. And I tell them, I'm really fasting. If it's soon, when the children can only fast, or when the pregnant woman will take fasting, they will be healthy, they will be healthy, they will be strong, they will be very strong. And they will be weak and listening. To their friend with me because they are care careful. And the business are telling them they listen to me and they say the health facility and plan for breath plan. And I also tell them for the pain that they give us. They help me and my family and my children. We are, they can feed us and they do other things for us. They are already be a house for and try to build community bathroom in the community. So it helping us. And I also want to allow our health to increase more women on this program. To increase more women because we don't want to talk to our friend women and, and for them to listen to us. So uh, I uh, ask in that have to increase more money on this program all over the world. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much uh, to Ruth and uh, Dr. Rumi, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us over here. Uh, representing the community health workers, specifically the lady health workers from Pakistan, uh, who despite going through several losses themselves, losing their houses, their family, their livestock, uh, their livelihoods are standing on where once was the ground in water, still uh, conducting immunization for polio in the camp, still informing the families uh, on immunization. Uh, on the need to, you know, prepare for dengue and still distributing mosquito nets uh, across the place, working with the government and with the development partners. I've tried to uh, get in touch with a couple of lady health workers and community midwives yesterday and this morning. And what they keep saying is that despite the fact that the entire workforce is made of females on the ground, their program leads uh, at the district level, at the province level, at the national level are primarily males. And uh, there is little or no consideration of what constitutes female challenges on the ground. They see uh, inclusion of female uh, gender parity agenda uh, for their career progression as a hope. They look forward to the strategic plan for lady health worker program, which is the first time the program is being strategically touched in the last 20, 25 odd years. So they look towards that as a hope. And then they look at other success models from the country. And they're also surprised when we tell them that uh, other countries and program, community health worker programs in other countries look up to them. 
look up to how they are delivering on ground and that they are a success model. Uh, uh, the the community health worker I spoke to this morning, the lady health worker, Parveen, she's working in Larkano and she did say that let others know that we can do it and so can you and we are the backbone of the health system whether you realize it or not, we are just content in the fact that we know that we are carrying the burden of this entire system on our shoulders or and out from Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rumi. Um, and thank you for um, representing community health workers, especially during um, times of crisis, particularly in Pakistan. I know community health workers are shouldering um, quite a lot, um, both in their own personal lives, but then all of the tasks that their communities look to them for. Um, so really appreciate your voice. And then again, um, from Ruth and her voice from Liberia. Um, so this ends the, the government section of our, our panel. I'd love to now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Madeline Ballard, the Executive Director of the Community Health Impact Coalition for a panel on community health funding. Madeline, over to you. Many thanks, Malika. Um, as we've heard, 70% of whom are women, improved health outcomes with considerable equity and economic dividends. Yet, uh, professional CHWs remain exception, not the norm. And this is really a dual-sided human rights issue. CHWs are both exploited and without adequate support, as we heard from uh, Dr. Rupa right at the opening of this event, they're less effective for patients. And the ultimate injustice is that despite decades of global health investment, one billion people around the world will still never see a health worker. So I'm thrilled today uh, to be joined by representatives of three ambitious funding mechanisms who are rewriting this story. Dr. Nicholas Oliphant, Senior Specialist for Community Health Worker Programming at the Global Fund. Dr. Herlinda Temba, Principal Medical Epidemiologist at the Africa CDC, as well as the CHW Coordinator for the PACT Initiative and co lead of the African and Primus, the health workforce branch chief HIV and AIDS. I'm going to start um, the panel by directing a question to uh, Dr. Alphant uh, from the Global Fund. We know um, that uh, the Global Fund has recently made a number of funding commitments uh, to community health via the replenishment and its commitment to Africa Frontline First. Are you able to share more of these recent developments? Great, thanks Dr. Ballard. Firstly, um, on behalf of the Global Fund, I'd um, like to thank Women in Global Health, uh, the Government of France, Last Mile Health, and the Community Health Impact Coalition for the opportunity to speak today among such esteemed ministers, panelists, and, and partners, uh, all of whom are leaders in global health, um, and happy to see so many women um, speaking today. It's an honor to be with all of you on the virtual sidelines of UNGA. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the work of Ruth, the community health workers of Pakistan, um, responding to the flooding there, as we just heard, and all CSWs everywhere, the vast majority of whom are women. Every day you are saving lives, making individuals, families, and communities healthier and safer, delivering quality, primary health care services, addressing social determinants of health, helping to detect and respond to outbreaks and pandemics, and building stronger and more resilient systems for health, well-being, and broader sustainable development. I want to underscore the Global Fund's commitment to all CHWs of all types everywhere. We are committed to decent work and protection for all CHWs. We support CHW professionalization and we commit to accelerating progress from gender policy to gender parity, ensuring that in practice, female CH CHWs do not get left behind in any way, that they are lifted up, that they are supported and empowered. We stand with you as an ally, as a partner, and as a champion for your cause. We also stand with you as a major source of funding for CSWs. In the current funding cycle, the Global Fund has provided nearly 500 million US dollars for CSWs and the systems they need to be effective. And as Dr. Ballard alluded to, and with a successful replenishment underway as we speak, fingers crossed, we plan to significantly increase the scale of our investment in CSWs to 1 billion US dollars, making it a major area of Global Fund investment. To kick this off, the Global Fund, in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson, the Skoll Foundation, and Africa Frontline First, have launched the Africa Frontline First Catalytic Fund, 
to mobilize at least $100 million in additional funding for CHWs and strengthening health systems so that they are ready to scale and sustain CHWs. This is a really exciting first step toward the target of $1 billion for the upcoming funding cycle. With a successful replenishment in the coming days, we hope to progress even further toward that goal. Importantly, I want to take this opportunity to underscore that the Global Fund recognizes CHWs of all types as workers in alignment with the WHO and ILO. Support for CHWs using funding from the Global Fund must align with national labor law and should align with national policies and strategies and where necessary support changes to national policy and strategy to align with WHO normative guidance and national law. Fighting one injustice, for example, health inequity by perpetuating another injustice, not paying CHWs for their work is no justice at all. We have a fundamental responsibility to ensure this is reflected in our grants and to strengthen monitoring and accountability in this area on the ground in the lived experiences of CHWs. We are adding a key performance indicator to be reported to the board of the Global Fund. It is a systems readiness index for CHWs that will capture whether CHWs are paid on time in full every time according to a contract with data disaggregated by CHW gender. In addition, we are committed to supporting countries and our recipients to strengthen their information systems and CHW master lists and registries to ensure that all CHWs of all types everywhere are counted because we count on them. In short, yes, we have a fundamental obligation to ensure CHWs are remunerated fairly and protected in alignment with national law. We hope that the large increase in funding um, to CHWs from the Global Fund, if we are successful in our replenishment, helps us to do that. We also hope that it can help us uh, better equip CHWs, train CHWs, supervise them and support them, and to ensure that they have a career progression pathway. So that, for example, female CHWs like Ruth may, have, may advance their careers in full expression of their potential as leaders in health. We ask that all partners stand with us in this regard, that we stand together with all CHWs of all types everywhere. Exciting uh, times, Dr. Ballard, back to you. Thank you so much, Nick, for those uh, remarks. I couldn't agree more that fighting one injustice by perpetuating another injustice is no justice at all. I think that was beautifully put. And that's actually why we at the Community Health Impact Coalition are so thrilled to be uh, co-hosting this event with Women in Global Health. The Community Health Impact Coalition works with community health workers uh, around the world for professionalization, for fair pay, for um, adequate support so that everyone can have access to healthcare. And Women in Global Health, of course, uh, along with Last Mile Health, are working for gender equity um, in global health. And these are connected struggles. And I think that's one of the main messages from today's panel. So thank you for articulating that uh, so beautifully and sharing the really practical steps that the Global Fund is taking to bring that uh, to reality. Financial commitments matter as do measurement, uh, because we know that what gets measured gets done. So we think that the Global Fund is really leading the way uh, in that respect um, by being one of the first large funders to actually track are the people who are delivering our commodities um, paid a fair wage. So kudos to you on that. Uh, I'm thrilled now to go to Dr. Harlinda Temba with our next question uh, from Africa CDC. Africa CDC has in recent months made strong statements in support of salaried professional community health workers. Uh, we'd love to see, of course, a similar trend uh, among all stakeholders, including INGOs uh, and national governments. What message do you have for those countries who've yet to commit to a professional CHW workforce in which women are fully represented? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Madeline and the organizers for having me. And thanks for the question. So I believe we all agree that the most epidemics do start and end at the community level. And that community health workers are the cornerstone for the preparedness and response to any epidemic or pandemic. Therefore, we really have to make sure that there is a whole of system to support community health workers, including paying for their work. The Africa CDC's PACT initiative has been speaking evidence on the impact of community health workers 
in pandemic response. Through the initiative, Africa CDC was able to recruit, train, equip, deploy, and pay over 26,000 community health workers across the 29 African Union member states. The efforts put forward by these community health workers have significantly contributed in the COVID-19 response on the continent. Therefore, Africa CDC urge all stakeholders and countries to join efforts to support community health workforce at scale. The financial sustainability of community health workers is both a smart investment and also empowerment tool to our communities. That is a true job creation, especially to women and the young. It takes a country ownership, leadership, donors, and partners' commitment to ensure financing pathway that supports community health workers' programs and systems sustainability. We can no longer expect performance of community health workers and systems in terms of diseases response if we are not ready to put in place a support system, payment included. That is why Africa CDC is working with a number of partners, including the Last Mile Health, Financing Alliance for Health, and ACHIP, and these are the co-members of the Africa Frontline First Initiative. And the initiative is aiming at supporting the scale up and strengthening of integrated and sustainable community health delivery in Africa. And also Africa CDC is looking forward to work with other partners and stakeholders in scaling up community health workers and systems in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Harlinda, for connecting the dots between the work during COVID with PACT and now Africa Frontline First Initiative, uh, which aims to create the resilient community health delivery um, and health systems that we wish that we had had uh, during the pandemic and where, again, where they existed, we saw a uh, real um, difference in terms of the continuity of services um, during the three or four first waves on the uh, African continent. Uh, I'm pleased now to go um, to our third panelist, uh, Ms. Diana Frimus from USAID, um, to, to follow up on that. The U.S. government uh, and USAID have uh, been instrumental uh, in supporting global health workforce and pandemic funding. Um, so building off what Dr. Harlan had just shared, um, in what ways will gender transformative policies factor into some of these um, financing efforts? Thanks so much, Madeline. And I'd, I'd like to start off by, by saying um, thank you to you and to all the organizers for the invitation to join you all. Um, and like my colleagues, I really appreciate the time to talk with you about the importance of the intersection of gender and the advancement of the health workforce agenda. Um, and really that underscores the importance of the gender health, equal health uh, and care workforce initiative. First, maybe just to start off briefly to, to note how a critical priority for USAID is to reclaim lost ground from the COVID-19 pandemic. And reversing this damage um, address it uh, requires addressing the core source of fragility of health systems, which we know is the lack of a robust health workforce that is consistently and adequately paid and well supported. And this is most critical at the point of the primary health care system. We know, um, as we have continued to hear today, including from the voices from the front line, uh, that community health workers are an integral cotter of the primary health care workforce, uh, which we know is multidisciplinary and responsible for the majority of services that are supported across all global health programs, spanning maternal child health, reproductive health, HIV, malaria, infectious disease, and uh, et cetera. Um, and is really key for the delivery of all essential services and also ensuring that flexible capacity to respond to outbreaks and health disasters like we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, and I think the global community, this is so timely discussion because we really have seen how this workforce is often the most neglected. So in May, uh, the White House launched the Global Health Worker Initiative, we as refer to as HWI. And USAID's HWI is critical to really enabling the catalytic and necessary, necessary focused investments to expand a more diverse and gender equitable health worker pipeline that is paid into local employment and really the ability to strengthen key country and regional institutions to more effectively plan, manage, and protect and support the health workforce. And I think this is really exciting because through supporting job creation and stability to meet demands of the health sector, investments in health workers will also support economic recovery as, and most critically across low middle income countries. And we know that expanding jobs, importantly, will create opportunities for women and youth, with women already representing 70% of the health workforce globally. Um, so it's exciting for me to share also within USAID, um, which I think is a great example of kind of how you can work to um, integrate gender transformative policies into the health workforce and also um, with efforts specifically to professionalize and formalize community health workers. But within USAID, we are working not only within our Global Health Bureau, but also with our regional, regional and other pillar uh, bureaus to identify the important cross-sectoral linkages and program uh, other program linkages to advance these goals. And we have incorporated our Health Workforce Initiative priorities into USAID's gender equality goals for the National Strategy for Gender Equality and Equity which aims to increase a gender equitable workforce um, and wage employment opportunities and decent work for women overall in the care economy. And I think this further demonstrates the importance and commitment to the informal workforce, the majority of whom are women in the health sector, which includes community health workers as part of the broader care economy and an opportunity to increase gender equitable paid employment and not only achieving health gains, but also in women's overall economic security. I think this really helps raise intention of the diversity of the informal workforce and employment needs in the health uh, sector, but also allows the global health community to broaden stakeholder engagement, to advocate and bring further policy change and develop innovative solutions to tackling barriers, not only in health, but overall with labor, economic growth and the private sector. Thanks so much, Diana. Um, we have time for about one more question and I'll come uh, back to you uh, to kind of develop some of the threads that you shared in, in your last answer. Um, you, you noted that USAID has kind of led the way on producing gender sensitive uh, and rights-based tools and, and, and guidance and funding um, for the community health workforce understood broadly. Uh, one example of that is the CHW AIM tool, um, uh, but there are many others. USAID, however, does not mandate the use of these tools um, and that guidance necessarily in country or through RFPs. So what is the best way for funders to help translate policy into practice, uh, as Nick was discussing, as Dr. Herlinda was discussing, um, while respecting the sovereignty and leadership of the governments with whom they work that we heard from earlier in the event. Great, thanks so much. And it's such an important and critical question. And, and I, and, you know, to note that USAID with the support of our partners um, has been a pioneer in the, in the field of the health workforce development, but also with including support to formalize community health workers. Of course, you mentioned the, the important uh, community health worker AIM tool. And right now around the world, uh, the agency is working with many country governments to support national priorities for formalizing community health workers. I think there are three things for funders to consider to help really trans translate some of the advocacy and policy into practice. I think the first, localization. We really need to see a commitment to supporting regional and national leadership that 
includes local government and non-governmental institutions to really to continue, to continue to build and transform the health workforce that includes community health workers. That's really so critical to resiliency and really advancing primary health care. So USAID is definitely actively working to promote and advance locally development in our work. Um, and I would say this also includes greater recognition of the roles of the entirety of the multidisciplinary workforce required for primary health care, of which community health workers are key, um, and elevating the voices um, of the entirety of the health workforce as not only key stakeholders, in, but also influencers and in decision making to advance provision of that holistic uh, whole person care. Um, Second, alignment. So similar to localization, we really want to see needing um, greater alignment and support of national and regional health workforce priorities, including formalizing community health workers. Um, and an important area of alignment is also for health worker remuneration. So we know that donors often support funding for rapid hiring and remuneration of health workers, often to address immediate and urgent service provision gaps due to health worker shortfalls. It is important to ensure that alignment um, of, of these pay scales um, with government policy and pay scales to support sustainability. So PEPFAR, a program that I have been worked on for a very long time, for example, makes an annual $1 billion investment in supporting over 200,000 additional health workers across PEPFAR supported countries, including community health workers. This investment has really been key to advance HIV goal achievement and PEPFAR country operational planning guidance. COP, we have specified a meeting to ensure alignment with pay scales uh, with government equivalent cadres, including community health workers. And our new data stream that we rolled out uh, last fiscal year, the HRH inventory, has really enabled us to have much greater insight into remuneration practices to guide alignment and harmonization. And this is something that many of our uh, teams across countries are actively working to um, further advance um, um, as we head into COP22 implementation. And lastly, accountability. Um, so I think donor provision of remuneration of health workers, and I know it can be um, a topic of debate um, about that practice, but um, as I mentioned, it's it's often a critical investment to support immediate needs. But I think it's an, also an important practice in demonstrating accountability of the promotion of decent work and fair pay of health workers across the globe. So like PEPFAR, in addition, we've now also seen the U.S. President's uh, Malaria Initiative, PMI, um, also, also shift its internal policy to allow use of malaria funds to remunerate community health workers who are critical to delivery of malaria services. So I think also donor support also helps further demonstrate accountability to overall pay of community health workers and broader health workforce and, and to advance uh, principles of decent work. So those three things in sum, localization, alignment, and accountability. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, for that considered um, answer. As we draw this final panel uh, to a close, uh, I just want to end on the note that, you know, despite significant evidence of their impact, community health workers, uh, again, are often underpaid, undertrained, under-equipped, and under-protected and disconnected from the formal health system. We know there is a 10 to one return on investment uh, for in support, when we support community health workers. Uh, every $1 produces up to 10 in terms of economic returns, uh, in terms of job creation, uh, and in terms of uh, pandemic preparedness and, and, and savings uh, from that safe infrastructure. Uh, Africa alone faces a $4 billion annual financing gap for community health, despite uh, this attractive prospectus and financing remains one of the largest systematic barriers to scaling and sustaining community health services. Uh, and so we're really excited to hear from the Global Fund, from Africa CDC and from USAID, how they're overcoming this fragmented funding landscape, how they're overcoming this focus on short-term outcomes and how they're uh, letting justice lead the way uh, in, in again, changing this narrative. I'm really pleased now 
uh, to introduce Ambassador Stephanie Sedou, the um, Ambassador for Global Health for the Government of France to help us close this event. Ambassador Sedou will provide remarks on behalf of France, a co-sponsor of the Gender Equal and Health Workforce Initiative. Honorable ministers and speakers, dear Rupa, welcome back. Dear partners and participants, bonjour à toutes et tous. I am very proud to represent the government of France for this crucial event of the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative, which was chosen as a top pick by the UN Assembly General Team. I'm glad the Portuguese speaking countries are in the spotlight today, and I congratulate Cabo Verde and Brazil, who have recently joined the initiative as well as UNICEF and the Integrate Health Partnership. First of all, I would like to thank all the amazing speakers. Once again, you showed us the strength and the irreplaceable role of women in health systems. I welcome in particular the actions implemented by the governments of Liberia, Ethiopia, Guinea-Bissau and Pakistan to promote policies of recognition and integration of community work in health systems an essential link in the health pyramid, especially since they are nominated by their peers. They live among their community and therefore they have the trust of the populations they serve. We see this on a daily basis in the projects of the French Muskoka Fund, a coordination mechanism pulling together WHO, UNICEF, UN Women and UNFPA to strengthen health systems and improve the health and well-being of women, newborns, children, and adolescents in Western and Central Africa. Because human resources are key to health systems, the French Muskoka Fund ensures that community workers are recognized and valued. In Togo, for example, community health workers have been specifically trained to carry out public health missions such as nutrition, monitoring vaccination records, and diagnosing the first clinical signs of disease. Giving women the means to de develop their potential, that is one of the objectives of the French Muskoka Fund. Everyone here is well aware of the crucial value of community work, especially in terms of lives saved. But it's not enough, and today's interventions prove it again. We still have many challenges ahead of us, and I would emphasize the absolute necessity of institutionalizing the status of these women workers, recognizing their work by training them, recognizing their work and worth through adequate salaries, ensuring their livelihoods, and ensuring that they are at the decision-making table. This is needed because the inequalities are still too dominant, as highlighted in the report delivered by women, led by men, which was issued by WHO and women in global health. The COVID-19 crisis gives us the opportunity to change the model and deconstruct the gender stereotypes that surround community care professions. Today, we have promising prospects for advancing this work. I'm thinking in particular of the ongoing negotiations on the pandemic treaty, or the establishment of the WHO, WHO Academy and the fifth, the fin Financial Intermediary Fund for Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response. These new instruments must serve health workers, health systems, and through them, women. In all these fora, France supports the fundamental role of human resources for health at every level of negotiation and encourages countries to strengthen training and the inclusion of health workers with a gender transformative approach in the initiatives to be developed. So let's seize the opportunity to sustainably change our software and to give women the place they deserve. Their work can no longer remain unpaid or underpaid. France will continue to defend the millions of women who care for us every day. Healthcare workers remain at the heart of the responses so our responsibility, and you can count on France, is to protect them. Thank you very much.
Thank you everyone for joining. Um, we hope you enjoyed this. Um, and we look forward to doing the next time we all connect and have a, a, success, a successful and productive UNGA week. Thank you, Malika and every colleagues. Good evening, good, good night. Thank you, bye.